Hi boys. It's Grandma B here with some new books for you this year. I'm going to read them all together on this movie so that you can see your book and then you'll also get to see the other books that your cousins and brothers have. So sometimes when you're together maybe you can read each other's or have somebody else read those to you. So I hope this will be fun. We're going to start with the youngest cousin for 2010 and that would be Mr. Finnegan! So Finnegan, look! Grandma has a book for you about Christmas time. This is called, Twas the Night Before Christmas. You might have something about Santa Claus in here. Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. Oh, is Santa Claus coming? Let's see. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. Oh boy, look at that. I wonder if there's a toy in there for Finn. Go find out. And then in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke, it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, right jelly, old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. Here he is, a jolly elf. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon led me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work. Filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. Is that how he gets back up the chimney? I'm going to try that. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim as he drove out of sight. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Very good. Here's the night before Christmas. I think you'll like that, Finnegan. And this will even let me.
me record my voice. So I'm going to record my voice in here again, and you can actually hear Grandma in the book. Let's see what we have for Shakovan this year. This is a little book called Jamberry, and it's all about picking all kinds of delicious berries in the woods and making all kinds of delicious foods. Yum. Jamberry. There's a bear getting his berries. One berry, two berry. Pick me a blueberry. Good. I like blueberries. Hatberry, shoeberry, and my canoeberry. Under the bridge and over the dam, looking for berries, berries for jam. Mm, I love jam and jelly. Oh, look at all the berries, and they fell down, and the canoe tipped over, and it's raining blueberries. Yummy. Three berry, four berry, hay berry, strawberry. Finger and paw berry, my berry, your berry. Mm, I like strawberries too. Strawberry ponies, strawberry lambs, dancing in meadows of strawberry jam. Mm -hmm. Quick berry, quack berry, pick me a blackberry. So we've got blueberries and strawberries and got blackberries. Train berry, track berry, clickety clack berry. Look at all the berries in the train. Rumble and ramble and blackberry bramble. Billions of berries for blackberry jamble. Yummy. Raspberry, jazzberry, razzmatazzberry. Berry band, berry land. Jamming in berry land. Yummy. Now they have raspberries. Berry land. Raspberry rabbits, brassberry band. Elephants skating on raspberry. Jam. Moonberry, starberry, cloudberry sky. Boomberry, zoomberry, rockets shoot by. It's a party now with all these berries. Mountains and fountains rain down on me. Buried in berries, what a jam jamboree. Here, do you see the blueberries and the strawberries and the blackberries and the raspberries? Yummy, this book makes me hungry, so we might need to go have some peanut butter and jelly. Now let's see what we have for Sequavion. Here is a book for Sequavion. Silly Sally. You know anybody named Sally? Do you know that my parents tried to call me Sally when I was just a very little baby? But it didn't take. So then they called me Sedilla. But this is a silly girl named Sally. Let's see what she does. Silly Sally went to town walking backwards upside down. Walking backwards upside down. On the way she met a pig, a silly pig. They danced a jig. Silly Sally went to town dancing backwards upside down. On the way she met a dog, a silly dog. They played leapfrog. Silly Sally went to town, leaping backwards, upside down. On the way she met a loon, a silly loon. They sang a tune. Silly Sally went to town, singing backwards, upside down. On the way she met a sheep, a silly sheep. And they fell asleep. Now, how did Silly Sally get to town sleeping backwards, upside down? Tickled the pig who danced a jig. He tickled the dog who played leapfrog. He tickled the loon who sang a tune. He tickled the sheep who fell asleep. Paul is tickling, oh my goodness. He tickled Sally who woke right up. She tickled Nettie Buttercup. That's how Sally got to town. Walking backwards, upside down. Now let's 
let's see what we have for Andrew to read. Remember in Silly Sally, she had fallen asleep? Well, this is about a whole house. She's asleep. It's called a napping house. And I think you'll like this when you have your new baby brother because sometimes babies need it to be very quiet so they can sleep. So naps are nice. Let's see what's happening in the napping house. And you also have a CD that goes with your book. It has some songs in there for the napping house. The Napping House by Andrea Wood and Don Wood. There is a house, a napping house, where everyone is sleeping. And in that house, there is a bed, a cozy bed in the napping house where everyone is sleeping. And on that bed, there is a granny, a snoring granny. Am I snoring granny? We'll have to ask grandma. On a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And on that granny, there is a child, a dreaming child, on a snoring granny on a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And on that child, there is a dog, a dozing dog, on a dreaming child, on a snoring granny on a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And on that dog, there is a cat, a snoozing cat on a dozing dog, on a dreaming child, on a snoring granny, on a cozy bed in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And on that cat, there is a mouse, a slumbering mouse, on a snoozing cat, on a dozing dog, on a dreaming child, on a snoring granny, on a cozy bed, in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. And on that mouse there is a flea. <gasps> Can it be a wakeful flea? On a slumbering mouse, on a snoozing cat, on a dozing dog, on a dreaming child, on a snoring granny, on a cozy bed, in a napping house where everyone is sleeping. Except that flea. What do you think is going to happen? A wakeful flea who bites the mouse. Oh no! Who scares the cat? Oh no, this cat, look how scared the cat is. Who claws the dog? Who thumps the child? Oh, I'm awake. Who bumps the granny? Oh no, now granny's awake too. Who breaks the bed? Ba Boom! In the napping house, where no one now is sleeping. So I guess the flea decided it was time for everybody to get up. So there you go. That's the napping house. Here is a book for Ethan. This is a funny little book called King Bidgoods in the Bathtub. The king is in the bathtub, and I don't think he wants to get out, so we'll find out what happens. King Bidgoods in the Bathtub. Help! Help! cried the page when the sun came up. King Bidgoods in the bathtub, and he won't get out! Who knows what to do? the night when the sun came up. Get out, it's time to battle. Come in, cried the king with a boom, boom, boom. Today we battle in the tub. He's having a big battle in the tub. Look at all those soldiers. Help, help, cried the page when the sun got hot. King bid goods in the bathtub and he won't get out. Who knows what to do? cried the queen when the sun 
got hot. Get out, it's time to lunch. Come in, cried the king with a yum, yum, yum. Oh my goodness. Today we lunch in the tub. He's got all of his food right there. Delicious. Help, help, cried the page when the sun sank low. King Big Good's in the bathtub and he won't get out. Who knows what to do? I do, cried the duke when the sun sank low. Get out, it's time to fish. Come in, cried the king with a trout, trout, trout. Today we fish in the tub. How are they catching fish in the tub? I'm not quite sure. The king is fishing in the tub. Help, help, cried the page when the night got dark. King bid goods in the bathroom and he won't get out. Who knows what to do? We do, cried the court when the night got dark. Get out for the masquerade ball. Come in, cried the king with a jig, jig, jig. Is he going to have the ball, the party? In the Tonight, we dance in the tub. Oh my goodness. Help, help, cried the court when the moon shone bright. King Bid Good's in the bathtub and he won't get out. Who knows what to do? Who knows what to do? I do, said the page when the moon shone bright. And then he pulled the plug. Glub, glub, glub. The king got out of the tub. So look carefully at the pictures because there are a lot of really cool things in the pictures, Ethan, as you read the story. All right, now we're going to get to Shai's book and then Cervantes' book. They have bigger books because they're older and they're bigger readers. Last year, Shai was reading all of the Harry Potter books. And Savante was reading all of the Wimpy Kid books. And this year, I have C.S. Lewis and Tolkien books for you. So Shai's book is The Hobbit. And this was the first story before he wrote The Lord of the Rings. So I think you'll find this a very good story. Sometimes you may even want to ask Mom to read some of it to you out loud. But I think you'll be able to read it yourself if you spend some time with it. There's also the maps and the secret language of the Shire and the Hobbits. So you can learn how to read the secret codes in here if you pay really good attention. The beginning of the book has a preface which tells a little bit about how the story was begun. So you may want to read that before you actually get started. But I am going to skip to the table of contents here. Page three is when the story actually begins, called an unexpected party. It also gives you a table of contents for all the pictures and the maps that are in the book that you can look at, what pages those are on, and some notes about the book. So now that you're reading bigger books, there's more in here that is really interesting. But you have to take some time, really read it carefully and think, and ask questions if you don't understand. Notice that the Hobbit here is written in the special language, so you'll have to start figuring out how to read these letters. But only the titles, the rest is written in English like you know already how to read. This is a story of long ago. At that time, the languages and the letters were quite different from ours today. English is used to represent the languages, but two points must be noted. Number one, in English, the only correct plural of dwarf is dwarfs, and the adjective is dwarfish. In this story, dwarves and dwarvish are used, but only when speaking to the ancient people whom Thorkin Oakenshield and his companions belong. Orc is not an English word. 
It occurs in one or two places, but is usually translated goblin or hobgoblin for the larger kinds. Orc is the hobbit's form of the name given at a time to those creatures. And it is not connected at all with our orc or orc applied to sea animals of the dolphin kind. Not the same. Runes were old letters originally used for cutting or scratching on wood, stone, and metal, and so they were thin and angular. The time of this tale, only dwarves made regular use of them, especially for private or secret records. See, if you learn to read the runes, then you'll be able to make secret codes, because nobody else knows how to read them. Their runes are in this book represented by English runes, which are known now to very few people. If the runes on Thor's map are compared with the transcriptions into modern letters on page 20 or page 50, the alphabet adapted to modern English can be discovered. And the above runic title also read. On the map of all the normal runes are found except for the little symbol for X. I and U are used for J and B. There was no rune for Q, so you have to use CW. Nor Z, the dwarf rune, and it gives you a little symbol, may be used if required. So then you can have the whole alphabet in runes. It will be found, however, that some single runes stand for two modern letters, like TH or NG. Other runes of the same kind were also sometimes used. The secret door was marked, and it tells you the symbol. You can read more about that. Here is the unexpected. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and oozy smells, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. The door opened up to a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel, a very comfortable tunnel without smoke, with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. The hobbit was fond of visitors. The tunnel wound on and on, going fairly, but not quite straight, into the side of the hill. The hill, as all the people for many miles round called it, and many little round doors opened out of it, first on one side and then on another. No going upstairs for the hobbit. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, lots of these. Wardrobes, he had whole rooms devoted to clothes. Kitchens, dining rooms, all these were on the same floor. And indeed the same passage. The best rooms were all on the left hand side going in. For these were the only ones to have windows, deep set round windows, looking over his garden and meadows beyond, sloping down to the river. Sounds nice, doesn't it? This hobbit was a very well to do hobbit, and his name was Baggins. The Bagginses had lived in the neighborhood of the hill for this time of mind, and the people considered them very respectable, not only because most of them were rich but also because they never had any adventures, nor did anything unexpected. You could tell what a Baggins would say on any question without the bother of asking him. This is a story of how a Baggins had an adventure and found himself doing and saying things altogether unexpected. He may have lost the neighbor's respect, but he gained well, you will see whether he gained anything in the end. And I'm going to stop right there because I want you to find out all about the adventures and what you think Bilbo gained. And now we're ready for Cervantes' book. Cervantes is 11 years old. We'll be 12 years old before we know it and be in the sixth grade before we know it. So I have a very big book for him because it's really several books in one. I think many of you all know about the adventures in Narnia and maybe you've heard some of the stories or seen the cartoons or movies. 
but reading the books will give you many more details and interesting facts about the land of Narnia. So, Savante, I think you'll enjoy reading this, but you might ask Mom to even sit with you and read sometimes out loud with your other brothers because there are great stories here. So I'm going to start and read just a little bit of the very first story, but notice when you look inside, there's a little flap cover here that just gives you a summary of about what the Chronicles of Narnia are. And then as we go through, there's an introduction, and then the table of contents. These are all the, the books that are in here. So you've got books within books. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven actual books. The fifth one here is The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is the movie that's coming out right now on one of the Chronicles of Narnia. But we're going to start with the very first one, which is called The Magician's Nephew, on page 7. The Magician's Nephew. And since each of these is a book, here are all the chapters for The Magician's Nephew. So, depending on which book you want to read, you can go to the table of contents for that particular book. So, this starts out with a chapter called The Wrong Door. Now, if you look, this book has very tiny print. So, while you're reading, you may want to use a bookmark or something, a page, to help you keep track of where you are reading until you get used to reading the small print in the columns. But they had to make it that small to get all of these books within this book. Chapter 1 of The Magician's Nephew, The Wrong Door. This is a story about something that happened long ago when your grandfather was a child. It is a very important story because it shows how all the comings and goings between our own world and the land of Narnia first began. In those days, Mr. Sherlock Holmes was still living in Baker Street, and the Bastables were still looking for treasure in the Lewis Sham Road. In those days, if you were a boy, you had to wear a stiff Eton collar every day, and schools were usually nastier than now. But meals were nicer. And as for sweets, I won't tell you how cheap and good they were, because it would only make your mouth water in vain. And in those days, there lived a London girl called Polly Plummer. She lived in one of the long row of houses which were all joined together. One morning, she was out in the back garden when a boy scrambled out from the garden next door and put his face over the wall. Polly was very surprised because up till now, there had never been any children in that house. But only Mr. Ketterly and Miss Ketterly, a brother and sister, old bachelor and old maid living together. So she looked up full of curiosity. The face of the strange boy was very grubby. It could hardly have been grubbier if he had first rubbed his hands in the earth and then had a good cry and then dried his face with his hands. As a matter of fact, this was very nearly what he had been doing. You ever been that dirty? Hello, said Polly. Hello, said the boy. What's your name? Polly, said Polly. What's yours? Diggory, said the boy. I say, what a funny name, said Polly. It isn't so half as funny as Polly, said Diggory. Yes, it is, said Polly. No, it isn't, said Diggory. At any rate, I do wash my face, said Polly, which is what you need to do, especially after, and then she stopped. She'd been going to say after you've been blubbing, but she thought, that wouldn't be polite. All right, I have then, said Diggory in a much louder voice, like a boy who was so miserable that he didn't care who knew he'd been crying. And so would you, he went on, if you'd lived all your life in the country and had a pony and a river on the bottom of the garden and then been brought to live in a beastly hole like this. London isn't a hole, said Polly, indignantly. The boy was too wound up to take any notice of her, and he went on. And if your father was away in India, and you had to come and live with an aunt and an uncle who's mad, who would like that? And if the reason that they were looking after your mother and, sorry, looking after your mother, and if your mother was ill and was going 
going to die. And then his face went the wrong sort of shape as it does if you're trying to keep back tears. I didn't know. I'm sorry, said Polly humbly. And then, because she hardly knew what to say and also to turn Diggory's mind to cheerful subjects, she asked, Is Mr. Kedberley really mad? Which means crazy. Well, he's either mad, said Diggory, or there's some other mystery. He has a study on the top floor, and Aunt Lettery says, I must never go up there. Well, that looks fishy to begin with. And then there's another thing. Whenever he tries to say anything to me at mealtimes, he never even tries to talk to her. She always shuts him up. She says, don't worry the boy, Andrew, or I'm sure Diggory doesn't want to hear about that. Or else, now Diggory, wouldn't you like to go out and play in the garden? What sorts of things does he try to say? I don't know. He never gets far enough. But there's more than that. One night, it was last night in fact, I was going past the foot of the attic stairs on my way to bed. I don't much care for going past them either. And I'm sure I heard a yell. Perhaps he keeps a mad wife shut up there. Yes, I thought of that. Or perhaps he's a coiner. Or he might have been a pirate, like the man at the beginning of Treasure Island, and be always hiding from his old shipmates. How exciting, said Polly. I never knew a house was so interesting. You may think it's interesting, said Diggory, but you wouldn't like it if you had to sleep there. How would you like to lie awake listening for Uncle Andrew's step to come creeping along the passage to your room? And he has such awful eyes. That was how Polly and Diggory got to know one another. And it was just the beginning of summer holidays, and neither of them was going to the sea that year, that they met nearly every day. Their adventures began chiefly because it was one of the wettest and coldest summers there had been for years. That drove them to do indoor things, you might say, indoor exploration. It is wonderful how much exploring you can do with a stump of a candle in a big house or in a row of houses. Polly had discovered long ago, if you opened a certain little door in the bottom room attic of her house, you would find a cistern in a dark place behind it that you could get into by a little careful climbing. The dark place was like a long tunnel with brick wall on one side and sloping roof on the other. In the roof there were little chunks of light between the slates. There was no floor in this tunnel. You had to step from rafter to rafter. Between them there was only plaster. If you stepped on this you would find yourself falling through the ceiling of the room below. Polly had used this bit of the tunnel just beside the cistern as a smuggler's cave. She had brought up bits of old packing cases and the seats of broken kitchen chairs and things of that sort and spread them across from rafter to rafter so as to make a bit of a floor. Here she kept a cash box containing various treasures and a story she was writing and usually a few apples. She had often drunk a quiet bottle of ginger beer in there. The old bottles made it look more like a smuggler's cave. Diggory quite liked the cave. She wouldn't let him see the story. But he was more interested in exploring. Look here, he said. How long does this tunnel go on for? I mean, does it stop where your house ends? No, said Polly. The walls don't go out to the roof. It goes on. I don't know how far. Then we could get the length of the whole row of houses. So we could, said Polly. Oh, I say. What? We could get into the other houses. Yes, and get taken up for burglars. No thanks. Don't be so jolly clever. I was thinking of the house beyond yours. I'm not let you read to see what happens because the house beyond his was an empty house. It had been empty for years. So they might actually be able to sneak inside. And who knows what adventures they might hope you enjoy all of the Chronicles of Narnia. And next year I'm going to find out if you read them all. So, 
We've finished all our books for this year, and I hope that you've really enjoyed them, and I hope you will read them all throughout the year and maybe share with each other your stories. We've got Silly Sally, Jamboree, The Hobbit, King Bidgood, The Napping House, Night Before Christmas, and The Chronicles of Narnia. Good job, Grandma. Thank you.